In the flattened forest at one spot, a pit was formed from which a stream flowed into the River Shambe. The Tunguska Road had previously crossed this place, but it was now abandoned because it was blocked, impassable, and this, of course, is because of the thousands and thousands of trees that are now laying over the road, right? But it was now abandoned because it was blocked, impassable, and moreover, the place aroused terror amongst the Tungusi people. The report of the Evanak, Ilya, the Evanak um, tribal member, Ilya Potapovich, about the stream deserves mention. And this is from one of the Russian authors who wrote extensively about um, extraterrestrial events and included a huge section in his book on uh, the Tunguska event. And a lot of these accounts are, are from his book, right? A stream, Chergima, actually flows from the place of the fall. This stream is of very ancient origin, as may be judged from its deeply carved out bed in the cliffs. And at one point, it has formed a great waterfall. So very suggestive there that we might have been looking at a feature that was created by some past catastrophic floods. One theory is that when the meteorite fell, a stream was formed as the result of the liberation of subterranean waters that had been under pressure. There's another possible assumption, namely that the ancient stream Chergama mentioned above did not exist when the meteorite fell, but its dried up riverbed had been preserved. When the meteorite fell and opened up underground water, the old stream bed was again filled with water and a new stream was formed. Now that to me is a very interesting dimension of this whole possibility that you have this stream that appears. This connection between this atmospheric event, this tremendous pressure, and the liberation of potentially reservoir of underground water. I'm sorry, I wasn't completely clear on what was happening there. Are they saying that there was an existing stream bed that was dry? Yes. Because there used to be water there, and then this meteor may have reopened the source? Is that yes. kind of? Okay, yes. all right. Wow, that yeah. is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so then uh, from another uh, account here, on the first, and this is where um, this is also from a report by Krinov, and this was another interesting side effect of this event of, of this of the Tungusi cosmic event. On the first night after the fall of the Tunguska meteorite. From June 30th to July 1st, 1908, and with lesser intensity and a few successive nights, extraordinary optical phenomena were observed in the Earth's atmosphere. Everywhere in Western Siberia and all over Europe, the attention of scientists and of a large number of people was primarily attracted by the unusually bright nights. In fact, it may be said that from June 30th to July 4th, July 1st, there was no night at all. At the same time, massive, glowing, silvery clouds were seen against a background of brilliant, colorful sunsets. So something yeah. has happened in the atmosphere. There's yeah, kind of a, an after effect. And um, it sounds like noctilucent clouds. Yeah. So now I'm going to show a, I'm going to do a screen share here. Uh, and I have a map of Western Siberia all the way over to England and the British Isles. These are locations where anomalously bright nights were reported following the Tunguska event of June 30th. So that opens up some interesting questions about what's going on there. And, and to me, the most likely explanation, there have been a number of variants offered, but the one is that if it was a piece of a comet, it may have brought in with it 
a lot of gases, volatile gases and so on that, you know, were brought into the atmosphere with it. And it is these gases in the atmosphere that are producing the unusual optical phenomena that was seen. Um, and of course, at the time, all of this, this unusual optical phenomena is being seen and witnessed by people in Europe. They don't know what's just happened over in Siberia, right? It's not until years later that researchers put two and two together and go, wait a second, oh, look at this. In the, in, for several nights right after the Tunguska cosmic event, you had these anomalously bright nights all over Europe. Even to the point, as they're saying, for the first two nights after, it was almost like there was no night at all. And the people did, in fact, think that was pretty strange. Um, I'm going to jump back to images here while I've got the screen share going. This was, I'm trying to remember where this came from, but this, I think, was actually sketched out by one of the witnesses or based Maybe it was like a, 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 a relative of somebody that lived through it that described it. I think that was it. Uh, hopefully, I can come up with the source of this. Um, but it kind of really shows the effect, you know, of the, the great explosion and the shock wave sweeping oh, yeah. over the ground and just blowing everything over. Wow. You can see, obviously, you see the the the... the, the Presumably some Tungusis there getting thrown about. You see here their hut is being thrown up. You see the reindeer are running, running. panicking away. You see the trees snapped off. The shockwave is moving across and will soon shear these trees off right at the ground. Yeah, we have a couple of things to share here. One, one, of, these is a, it's one of these is one of my favorite artist impressions of what they think the explosion may have looked like, you know, from a, from up in the sky. Okay. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. Yes, I have seen that. Yeah. So there's multiple impact, you know, explosions. This is the first one here right. probably. And then more and more, and then it just keeps expanding. And then there's the shockwave coming out. Mm -hmm. And that's a, now I this know, is I like interesting, it. this domed effect. Yeah, that, that shockwave has hit the ground is now mm -hmm. rebounding somehow. Rebounding, right. Yeah. The other one Kyle pulled up here, these are noctilucent clouds. Yeah. So you can mm -hmm. see how bright they are. Yeah. They're supposedly they're made by ice crystals that are way up in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So the sun can keep them lit for a long time after it goes down. Yeah. And that was, I think that's one of the speculations as to the anomalously white nights. Yeah. Um, if it if it left crystals. a lot of material, yeah, yeah left if it a blanketed the upper atmosphere with ice crystals or whatever, you know, yeah, from the blast, because you know that that pressure is going to crystallize a lot of water vapor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is from one of the early. This was in published. What I'm about to to read to you now is um, published in 1931. J. G. Crowther in Scientific American, and this is now, of course, when when a lot of this knowledge is now coming to American scientists for the first time, right? So he writes, many other reports referred to the devastation of the forest and the felling of the trees in uniform directions, one to the destruction of several Tungus families and one to a forest fire. The Tungus' terror of the district will be understood when I report that Professor Kulik told me the occurrence had caused the evolution of a new tribal religion. They regarded the arrival of the meteorite as a visitation from a god named Agdi, meaning fire, to punish the wicked. The place is believed to be accursed. So that was way back in 1931. Then in 1996, uh, Kevin Zonley, uh, an astronomer, wrote uh, uh, an article in Nature entitled, Leaving No St Stone Unburned. And he starts out his article by saying that perhaps the earliest wild, widely held theory for the Tunguska explosion was that the world was about to end. Now that was... Yeah, that was the impression of a whole lot of these people that witnessed this thing, was this is it. 
this is, it's over. The world is now going to be destroyed. There's no way that we can be experiencing something this powerful that is not the end of the world. The Tunguska impactor exploded above a sparsely inhabited region in central Siberia with the force of a 15 megaton bomb. The blast wave flattened trees over 2,000 square kilometers and excited a magnitude 5 earthquake. Thermal radiation scorched trees and set fires over much of the range and even 70 kilometers, which is about 45 miles away, an observer removed his shirt for fear it would ignite. He goes on to say that the earliest scientific expeditions to the impact site, launched almost two decades after the event, concentrated on the search for meteorites. But no meteorite was found. Instead, the explorers found a huge region of trees felled in a striking radial pattern, at the center of which they found standing trees stripped of branches. Apparently, the meteor exploded in the air. So recent attention has focused on whether the Tunguska body was a comet or an asteroid, which gets us back to that, um, that controversy. And then finally, he says, at present, there are two reports of possible debris. One is a modest iridium excess in local peat. The other, a relatively high abundance of microscopic dust particles embedded in tree resins exposed between 1902 and 1920 in local conifers that survived the explosion. These may prove to be extraterrestrial, but neither is likely to determine the exact type of impactor. Then there was a Russian scientist, Andrei Yulolkhvatov. Uh, sorry, I don't speak Russian, so my, my pronunciation is probably way screwy. He wrote in uh, a Russian publication that was translated in 2003. He comes up with, a, with an alternate theory, which I don't necessarily accept, but it brings up and points to a very interesting coincidence. From the geological aspect, the Tunguska uh, event occurred in a rather remarkable place in the southern part of the Siberian platform. It was the place of some of the most powerful volcanic activity in Earth's history 250 million years ago, a former hot spot. The area is rich in various gas, oil, and ore deposits, including rare earth elements and platinoids. There are kimberlites in the region too. The upper mantle in this region has anomalous speeds of seismic waves. The Tunguska epicenter is right in the middle of the Paleovolcano crater. I find that interesting. You know, it's almost like the Tunguska event is pinpointing this specific spot on the surface of the earth where you had one of the largest, if not the largest volcanic event known in the history of the planet. Kimberlite pipes are pipes that come up and they, uh, under tremendous pressure. You know, diamonds are often found in kimberlite pipes. The upper mantle in this region has anomalous speeds of seismic waves. So maybe the tectonic nature of this area had something to do with the, the impression that eyewitnesses had of, of there being a subterranean component to the event. Okay, so kimberlite is an igneous rock, mm -hmm. which sometimes contains diamonds. Mm -hmm. It is named after the town of Kimberley in South Africa, mm. where the discovery of an 83.5 carat diamond called the Star of South Africa in 1869 spawned a diamond rush. Mm. But uh, I don't see kimberlite pipes. Yeah, there it goes. Kim kimberlite occurs in the earth's crust and vertical structures known as kimberlite pipes as mm -hmm. well as igneous dikes mm -hmm. also occurs as well also occurs as horizontal sills mm -hmm. yeah sill is horizontal i was yeah. pipe is vertical and so what you have is a magmatic intrusion I I into a, 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 the crust yeah it says the consensus is they are formed deep in the mantle yeah 
at 150 to 450 kilometers below the surface, and hmm, they are erupted rapidly and violently. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So this, the Tunguska event, was dead center on this paleo, this ancient, deeply eroded paleovolcanic crater, which undoubtedly played a large part in causing the greatest mortality event in the history of life on Earth, the so-called Great Dying at about 251 million years ago, the Permian at the Permian-Triassic boundary. And when we talk about the great mass extinctions in Earth history and their possible causes, of course, we are going to talk more about the Permian-Triassic. So here are the microbarograms that had been recently installed in England at uh, six English meteor meteorological stations from the morning of June 30th, 1908. And basically what you see here is the shock wave passing over England that morning, registering on the, the microbarographs, but nobody knowing what's causing this anomalous pressure pulse that's passing over England. And here you see a composite barogram showing the multiple wave fronts passing over England. And this is after Fred Whipple. Um, so yeah, this, this, is, this is the pressure waves in the atmosphere that encircle the earth twice. And so here are some of the observed characteristics, just sort of a bullet list of the things I put together through reading the various accounts and so on. The observed characteristics of the Tunguska event a ball of fire brighter than the sun, multicolored, often rainbow streamers forming a tail. The sky opens up, fire pours out, or sky split in two, deafening thunder, extremely loud crashes, bangs, etc. Subterranean trembling slash shaking like locomotives passing below. Sense of heavy beams or stones striking the ground. Ground and buildings shaking, intense pressure blast wave, extreme heat pulse, and a pillar of fire and pillar of smoke. So those are some of the characteristics. Then there are secondary effects, which we have only looked at a few of those. Um, for example, one of them was the anomalous optical and atmospheric effects, the white nights, the sky glows, noctilucent clouds, etc. But there were also uh, intense and prolonged solar halos in the aftermath. And there were heavy, intense meteorological and precipitation events over all over Europe in the days after. Um, there was also a de decrease in atmospheric transparency detected in the U.S., like as if the, the atmosphere was loaded with something. And we won't really so much get into this because um, it gets kind of technical, and we'd have to devote more time to it, but I'll point it out anyway, that there were disturbances in the points of neutral polarization in the scattering of sunlight, which is a direct function of atmospheric turbulence. There has also been found magnetic microspherals uh, that have now been found deposited in the regional soils. And let's see, what were some of the others? Yeah, so there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on. Uh, enhancement of carbon-13 and iridium in peat layers associated with the catastrophe, extremely rapid recovery of forest after the catastrophe, and accelerated growth in trees surviving the catastrophe. The trees that survived the catastrophe underwent a growth spurt. And there was also, and this is a lot of this is in Russian, and I wish more of it would get translated in English, but there was a sharp increase in genetic mutation of plants possibly animals in the area of the catastrophe. So, yeah, a lot of interesting things going on there. You know, back in 1930, the, 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 the great Fred Whipple, who was one of the godfathers of comet scientists, wrote uh, in the Quarterly Journal of the Royal Meteorological Society an article. Again, one of the early articles published in English about the Tunguska event. It's entitled, The Great Siberian Meteor and the waves, seismic and aerial, which it produced. So he says, 
There are many marvelous features in the story of the Siberian meteor, a story without parallel in historic times. It is most remarkable that such an event should occur in our generation and yet be so nearly ignored. No civilized man sought out the falling place of the meteor for 20 years, and even now no one has followed up the track of the pioneer. That was in 1930. This paper has been devoted to the incidental effects, and it is therefore appropriate to emphasize two coincidences. Seismographs were in readiness to demonstrate that earth waves can be produced by the impact of a meteor with the ground. Now, at, in 1930, they were still thinking that there was maybe a, a, an actual impact of the ground. However, we could, we could now rewrite that sentence to say that seismographs are in ready to, readiness to demonstrate that earth waves can be produced by the impact of a meteor with the atmosphere, right? Microbarographs had been invented just in time to preserve records of the airwaves generated in the atmosphere. If the meteor had fallen even five years earlier, there would have been no evidence for the spreading of the airwaves beyond the immediate locality of the fall. If it had fallen 20 years earlier, we should known nothing. We should have known nothing of the earth waves. So timing wise, it's good that it happened when it did, you know, like it says, and, and, and because of that, because of what we know about what happened to the atmosphere, it's the atmospheric response as well as the seismic response has really provided a lot of insight into the nature of this event, without which we'd still be um, scrambling to try to make sense out of it. Then in 1976, one of the very first books I read on the event, I mean, I actually remember hearing about this event probably even as a kid, but but I think I, I read my first book was The Fire Came By by John Baxter and Thomas Atkins, published in 1976. Had an introduction by uh, Isaac Asimov. He says in his introduction, he says, once and only once. Now, before I read that, let's consider. The location we've already seen is interesting because it almost seems to target dead center onto this paleovolcano that was one of the largest most disruptive, explosive events in the history of the planet, endogenic from within the planet. And so, and then we have what Whipple is pointing out, that the timing was, was coincidental in that had it happened 20 years earlier, we would have known nothing about either the seismic waves or the aerial atmospheric phenomena, Right. Now, Isaac Asimov says, once and only once in known history was there a clear and documented event that looked as though a large meteorite had fallen on Earth. It took place only seven decades ago in 1908 in Siberia. It was an amazing fall. On the one hand, it did enormous damage, for it fell in a forest and knocked down every tree for scores of miles in every direction. On the other hand, it did very little damage for it killed not one human being. Consider how unusual that had to be. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. If that fall had taken place anywhere in the ocean, tsunamis would have, been, uh, would have washed the nearer shores and could have done much damage. Another 10% of the Earth's surface is covered by permanent ice. If the fall had taken place there, enough melting might have come about to cause the slippage of large quantities of ice into the ocean, bringing about catastrophic changes in Earth's sea level and climate. And what's interesting there is he's describing precisely uh, a Heinrich event when, you know, the documented uh, evidence now of there being episodes where huge amounts of, of glacial ice are disgorging into the oceans, right, with no clear explanation on what's driving these events for these massive armadas of icebergs to be discharged out in, into the ocean. He goes on to say that at least 15% of what is left of Earth's surface is populated more or less thickly 
with human beings and is littered more or less thoroughly with the products of their civilization. If the fall had taken place there, anywhere from hundreds to millions of people would have been killed, and anywhere from thousands to billions of dollars of damage would have been inflicted. The fall would have completely wiped out any city it had struck. Perhaps not more than 5% of the surface of the earth could have received that 1908 blow without any damage at all being done to human life and property. And with the odds 20 to 1 against it, that fall took place safely from the human standpoint. By the same token, though, the place in which the fall occurred was inaccessible or else it would have been populated, and it was years before the vicinity could be examined. It was only then that the real mystery began. Consider that the fall managed to find that one in 20 place where it would do no damage, almost as though someone was humanely trying to avoid question mark, question mark, question mark. Modern science is rediscovering what our ancient ancestors knew. Periodically, planet Earth is overcome by sweeping catastrophic events that completely remodel the landscape of the world, reset the global ecological clock, and disrupt humankind's efforts to build a sustainable civilization. The forces of nature that trigger such events are still operational and will remain so despite our refusal to acknowledge them. But whether we accept it or not, we are inextricably a part of a cosmic ecosystem. And our fate is tied to phenomena which, for the time being, is beyond our ability to successfully respond. This can change, but only with a major change in our priorities as a civilization. The process begins with education. Please join us and participate remotely as the Cosmic Summit will be live streamed to the world via HowTube.com.